And now, Move the Sticks with Daniel Jeremiah and Bucky Brooks. Hey everybody, what's going on? DJ Bucky back here for Move the Sticks. And uh, Buck, man, first of all, we gotta, we're gotta we going to get to a jam-packed show here, a big lineup. We've got a great interview coming your way. But I, I do have to ask you off the top here, did you watch Game 7 of the World Series last night? I did watch a little bit of it. I did. Very very impressive um, Takeaway. Give me a takeaway. Well, I think the, the takeaway will be from a team-building standpoint. Like, the Washington Nationals bypassed re-signing one of their players to a big contract and actually got a better team. So I now wonder if you're building a team, especially in baseball, and your marquee player comes up and he wants $300 plus million, do you just kick the can down the street and go and invest that money in other places? Or are you willing to give up that much money and say that this one piece is going to be the piece to help us get over the top? I just think a lot of agents lost a lot of money because I think it's going to be harder and harder to sell these marquee players at the prices that we've seen some of them go of late. I'll tell you what the uh, you know obviously I think you could point to arms over bats if if uh, yeah. you're looking for some type of a tiebreaker there man that uh, impressive the what uh, Strasburg really getting the MVP of the series to kind of keep them in it with two wins to get them to that point was impressive but uh, with Strasburg Scherzer uh, it was a fun it was fun baseball I mean I've I've really uh, probably watched more of this World Series than I have any other World Series recently um, the other takeaway that I would have is man I'm I'm watching it really for both teams. There, there's no easy. There's no easy outs. Like there's every at bat is a grind, man, and they just don't give in. It was fun to watch, man. I enjoyed it. No, it was fun. It kind of took me back to the way baseball used to be played in terms of yesteryear. Like everything was very methodical. Every uh, station to station type baseball with some big boppers. Uh, you talked about both teams being very, very difficult to get out. I do believe it's building a roster that makes it very challenging for the pitchers. Some righties, some lefties, some contact hitters, some guys that have the ability to kind of get on the base in a variety of ways. Uh, The Astros and the Nationals deserve a lot of credit. And I think the one thing that'll show up, and we've heard this uh, consistently while we've been doing these um, podcasts with coaches, the toughness that both teams displayed, the mental toughness, the Astros being down 0-2 and bouncing back and taking a 3-2 lead, the Nationals then coming back from elimination to win uh, win the World Series. I just believe somewhere in the evaluation, you have to be able to gauge the grit, uh, the toughness, the resiliency. That has to be a part of your scouting report these days because the championship teams, they all show their mettle in these pressure pack situations and I'm always looking for new scouting terms for football and I heard one from Max Scherzer after the game when he was actually talking about the uh, the lineup of the of the Astros he said that's a grimy lineup like you know we talk about gritty tough he used the word grimy I was like you know I know some football players who are kind of grimy uh, just kind of they're just kind of always around the football they're gnats you can't get away from them uh, so I had I wrote that one down grimy I'm gonna I'm gonna incorporate that in a scouting look, man, report here this year but look grimy gritty tough um the ability to be able to bounce back, all those things. Um, I think at the end of the day, I mean, we used to refer to it as blue collar or uh, lunch pail, yeah. hard hat, all of those things. I think at the end of the day, you got to have people that are not afraid to get in the dirt. They're not afraid to do the dirty work. They're willing to make the sacrifice. They are willing to kind of take on whatever role the manager and the general manager gives them for the greater good of the team. I think that's the bigger piece of the puzzle. Finding guys that are willing to be a little selfless to take on roles that enhance the team rather than, hey, I want to play a certain way, and this is the only way that I can play regardless of what the team needs at the moment. No doubt uh, with you 100%. Speaking of baseball, by the way, uh, we have a guest today who has a connection to baseball. Jake Heaps is going to join the show. Jake Heaps uh, was a quarterback in Seattle. Uh, he's somebody that's uh, worked with Russell Wilson for a long time. In the offseason now, they spend a lot of time together. Uh, he really kind of works with him and keeping him sharp mechanically and uh, heads up uh, Russell Wilson's uh, quarterback academy. Uh, somebody you know as well from the Elite 11, Buck, who's mm-hmm. a guy that's worked with you and, and uh, Dilfer and all those guys working with those top quarterbacks each and every year so we're going to get we're going a little insight there on russell wilson we talk about him being a kind of a unicorn uh somebody that at his size has been able to play at such a ridiculously high level and really open doors for guys like baker mayfield and kyler murray uh so we're going to find out a little bit more about russell wilson and what makes him tick talking to jake heaps now this should be a fun 
conversation. Jay Keeps is one of the best uh, quarterback trainers in the business. This is a guy that I don't know if many people know this. Jay Keeps was the number one recruit when he was coming out of high school, five-star quarterback that made his way to college, bounced around a little bit. It'll be uh, interesting to not only talk about Russell Wilson, but what he's seeing coming through the pipeline, how the quarterback position is changing, changing, and how the private coaching has helped accelerate the development of some of these young quarterbacks that we've seen make it to the league and have success right away. All right, we're going to do uh, look forward to that conversation. Also, we're going to have a little segment we're going to do most impressive, most disappointing, and uh, some rising different position groups in the NFL as we're halfway through the season. I'll give you some hits and misses. Always have a lot of fun with that. I'll read a report I got right, a report I got wrong, see if you can figure out who we're talking about. And we'll answer some of those uh, questions you guys have left us on Apple Podcasts. Again, if you have any questions for us, leave us a review, a little ranking there, a rating on uh, Apple Podcasts, drop a question in there, and we answer it each and every Thursday. Uh, Buck, news-wise, I don't think there's a whole lot going on. You want to just jump into these position groups here? Yeah, let's just, just jump right into them. All right, let's start off first here with the wide receiver position. Through the first half of the season, Buck, I'll let you go first here. Let's start out first with the most impressive group of wideouts through the first half. Well, so I've already been privy to your answer, so I'm going to leave your answer. I'm going to let it be. I'm going to say this team is, is really impressive when they all are together and playing, the Houston Texans. And the reason why the Houston Texans wide receiver core is the most impressive group to me is I see all of the pieces of the puzzle perfectly aligned, and they fit. DeAndre Hopkins is a natural number one he makes those plays that are there to be made when Will Fuller's in the lineup he's the vertical stretch guy we see the explosive plays happen when Deshaun Watson is able to find him down the field the trade that they made and it didn't get a lot of attention but Kenny Stills coming over from Miami I believe he is the Mm -hmm. perfect number three Uh, we've seen him show up in little moments he can run uh, all the intermediate routes he has some some sizzle and some juice when he has the ball in his hands when I look at the Houston Texans and they haven't necessarily maxed out their potential but man I think this wide receiver core is ideal for the quarterback they have in Deshaun Watson Um, as they get down the stretch I think you'll see them make a bigger impact on the Texans games that's a great answer. I like that group. Uh, I'm going to go, though, to the Los Angeles Rams. And this is a group that uh, you knew what you had in Brandon Cook, somebody that's a, a vertical stretch receiver who's tough after the catch. You had Robert Woods, who's one of the better route runners in the NFL, is outstanding on crossers and do a lot of the dirty work, even help you in the run game as an outstanding blocker. But Cooper Cup. Cooper Mm -hmm. Cup is on pace for over 1,500 yards receiving. He's doing a lot of that damage in the slot. He's physical. He's tough. The yards after the catch are ridiculous with what he's been able to do working there with Jared Goff. So talk about variety of receivers, guys that can do different things and fill different roles. Uh, Man, I think this Rams group is as good as it gets. Maybe the only thing you could say they're missing is just that kind of hulking giant uh, Mm -hmm. down there in the red zone. Uh, But this group collectively, they're explosive and they've got outstanding hands, which is something and I'll always appreciate. They do have terrific hands, do a great job of catching the ball in space, and I, I do like the way that they complement one another. Cooper Cup coming off that huge 200-plus yard game uh, overseas, but we've seen Robert Woods and Brandon Cooks both play um, – big driving force roles for this offense and when they're going and when everything is working on this offense I know we've been kind of down on the Rams this year because they haven't been as spectacular as they've been the previous two years but when they are going they are as tough a group to defend as any group in the National Football League so they deserve to certainly be on this list. All right, let's flip it around here. The most disappointing receiver group through the first half of the season is who? Man, for me, it has to be the Cleveland Browns. And I can't put it all on the wide receivers. I think play calling, I think quarterback play, all those things have been factors. But whenever you just read the list, if we were playing the video game and you had a choice to pick any uh, wide receiver core to play with on Madden, you would like to think that a, a core with OBJ and Jarvis Landry would have a ton of success. And... On paper, they should. But for whatever reason, it's not playing out like that. And I know this team has kind of gotten away from themselves. They're doing a little more 11 personnel, three wide receivers on the field. And it hasn't delivered the kind of promising results that we expected. But right now, I'm just looking at OBJ and Jarvis Landry. And the first word that comes to mind when I look at them on the field, wasted. I think the Cleveland Browns Mm -hmm. are wasting the the talent and the personnel that they have on the perimeter. They're not letting those guys have the ball enough to really impact the game. And I'm saying this full, fully aware that Nick Chubb is the driving force of the offense. They have to find a way to make Nick Chubb a priority while also getting OBJ and Jarvis Landry the ball enough where they can impact it. 
Yeah, look, the schedule's set up for them to get on a little bit of a run. We'll see if they can get this receiving group uh, unlocked and rolling here. I, I'm going to go to a team that's uh, had a big win uh, recently, but the Philadelphia Eagles, the receiving core, over the first half of the season, they've been disappointing to me for really kind of a bunch of different reasons. Um, you bring him Deshaun Jackson. Deshaun it made some big plays. You saw that explosiveness, and unfortunately, uh, durability has been an issue. Hasn't been able to get out there on the field. Nelson Aguilar has had some huge, costly drops. One of them in the Atlanta game probably cost him that football game uh so that's been disappointing alshon jeffrey's been good he's been solid um but you know jj arcega whiteside i thought might have a chance to really emerge and pop as a rookie that hasn't really happened yeah and just overall especially without deshaun jackson buck this team just they lack juice they lack some explosiveness down the field and i thought we'd see you know a more dynamic explosive passing game it hasn't happened it hasn't happened and i'm really surprised because man i thought this crew was locked and loaded and ready to go with carson wentz returning uh deshaun jackson adding the juice on the perimeter i thought we would see a lot of protection i know deshaun jackson has been hurt but still this is an experienced group a group that has won a super bowl together for whatever reason it just hasn't worked and so we'll see what kind of um resurgence they can make down the stretch this season all right let's get to an up and coming group this is a young group of receivers that we're excited about for the future who do you got Man, it's funny. You talk about a young group. I, I didn't take it necessarily a young group, but I think this team is up and coming in the passing game, and that's the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, we heard Kirk Cousins okay. have to make an apology to Adam Thielen and Stefan Diggs for the way their offense was performing. Well, since that apology, this group has done nothing but tear it up on the perimeter. And this is a team that has become a Dalvin Cook-driven team where the running game is really setting it up. They're living in 21 personnel, and Thiggs and Thielen on the outside are absolutely getting it done. Uh, it took a while. They started off slow, but right now, I think you can make the case that the Minnesota Vikings offense is one of the more feared offenses in football because it's balanced, but it's also explosive in the passing game. Yeah, they've, they've got it going. I think you're right, Buck. They've found their rhythm. We'll see if they can hold that and maintain that as we go through the second half of the season. Uh, I'm going to go to a group of the stats. You're not going to be impressed by the stats, but having seen this team up close and in person, I love the Tennessee Titans' young duo of wide receivers. you got the rookie A.J. Brown out of Old Miss, who is a physical specimen when you see him out there. Uh, absolutely a stud after the catch. He's got strong hands. He's going to emerge as a big-time playmaker for this team. And then Corey Davis, uh, first-rounder from a couple years ago. You're starting to see him start to blossom a little bit. There haven't been a lot of opportunities in this offense, unfortunately, for these guys. But since the switch at quarterback, you're starting to see them come to life a little bit. And if I was kind of buying futures, uh, I, I would like to buy the futures here with this Tennessee Titans receiving core. These are big, hulking, impressive dudes. Uh, they're going to be a matchup problem for people in that division. They are matchup problems. And I think the thing we've talked about this on previous podcasts, Looking at physicality at the wide receiver position, uh, it is about the juice and it's about this, the craftsmanship, but really the guys that are beginning to dominate and impose their will in the National Football League oh, are tough. those physical, yeah. tough, uh, gritty wide receivers. And look, Tennessee is putting together a nice score because what you're seeing in A.J. Brown is a physical, tough guy that can win on the outside. And then Corey Davis is finally settling in and being the player that most people thought that he would be when he was picked very, very high in the draft. If they can continue to develop like they've been developing this year, yeah, you talk about a team that is very, very problematic on the outside, especially with Ryan Tannehill playing well at quarterback. All right, I want to get your thoughts. Let's switch gears now. Let's get to the running back position, Buck. Uh, the most impressive group uh, at the running back position through the first half of the season, who you got? I think I'm going to surprise you because I'm going to go with the Minnesota Vikings. And I'm going to go with the Minnesota Vikings because they are absolutely running the ball and cramming it down people's throats. Everyone has talked about Dalvin Cook, and Dalvin Cook has been absolutely terrific. But people aren't talking about his partner, Alexander Madison. Both of these guys are getting it done on perimeter runs, meaning runs outside the tackle. Dalvin Cook has 14 rushes of 10 plus yards uh, on the outside against slight boxes. Look, Madison is fifth in those with nine rushes of 10 or more yards. So the explosive runs in the running game have really put the Vikings and helped them kind of get back off a disappointing start. This running game is really, really good. They're a dominant unit, a dominant duo together. 
Yeah, they've run the ball extremely well. I think that scheme matches the personnel, too. I mean, as Dalvin Cook was born to run in that system, and he's been outstanding. Uh, I'm going to go to the 49ers, and I love the creativity that Kyle Shanahan has in their run game design. But, man, they've got a trio of backs there, Buck. When you look at Mostert, the way he's played, you look at Tevin Coleman, uh, what he's done, giving him some of that pop, some of those deep runs. Breida runs hard. He's been very efficient. You know, Kyle Juszczyk, I think, is the best fullback in the NFL. Unfortunately, he's been down and injured a little bit. But that collection of backs – to go along with just what they do creatively in the run game, a lot of that deep motion, they do a nice job of pulling guys out of the box and, uh, and creating great lanes and great matchups. And even without uh, their starting two tackles, they've had some injuries there. This team has continued to run the ball extremely well. So to me, the most impressive group of running backs, that's Kyle Shanahan's group up there in San Francisco. Look, man, I know you can make the case for that. They got three guys that, that are absolutely running the ball uh, at will. And the way that they're doing it, you talked about Kyle Shanahan's creativity. This team leads the league and pre-snap pre motions and shifts. And so when you oh, really yeah. look at them on tape, they're running about four or five running plays. But all of the organized chaos before the snap makes it nearly impossible for the defense to figure it out. This is a brilliant design, a brilliantly designed running game with the right runners that fit the scheme. Everything is working in San Francisco. And I think it's interesting that both of these teams are running very similar type schemes and they found the right running backs yep. to fit when you talk about the 49ers and the Vikings both running variations of the Mike Shanahan and Alex Gibbs running game. Yeah, there's no secret there. That that uh, that run game is tried and true. It's been that way for about 30 years now. Uh, all right, most disappointing running back group. Who you got? I'm going to go to Chicago Bears. I'm going to go to Chicago Bears because, DJ, you remember a couple years ago when Tariq Cohen came in the league? Man, they gave him the ball everywhere. Oh, yeah. He was touching it. He was exciting. Uh, we talked about him maybe being a little combination of Tyreek Hill and Darren Sproles because of the versatility that he displayed early. And I don't know what happened. I don't know what has happened with Matt Nagy and the creativity and the running game, but it's not, it's not appearing. We're not seeing uh, these guys dominate on the ground. And I love David Montgomery in the draft. I think he's a perfect pro. Yep. But they just have not been able to run the ball consistently. Some of that is due to the quarterback and the issues that he's having and them not being able to kind of get those guys uh, out of the box. But Tariq Cohen, David Montgomery, so much more was expected of them. And at some point, the Bears need to get the production or they could find themselves on the outside of the postseason tournament. Yeah, you know, I think if you want to be encouraged as a Bears fan, uh, last week they finally got David Montgomery going. They gave him a bunch of carries after running the ball only seven times the week before. They ran it a bunch against the Chargers. I found some success there, but the, the rest of the first half of the season, it's been a nothing burger with that rushing attack. So uh, I'm with you. I expect a little bit more, but maybe there's some a bright side there that they can get this thing turned around because I do think those two runners uh, are very talented. I'm going to go my most disappointing group. Look, this is a bad football team, the Cincinnati Bengals. Uh, I know they've had injuries along that offensive line but Joe Mixon we know how talented he is Gio Bernard's a nice complimentary back uh, nothing Buck I mean nothing they can't run the football and I, I know it's a combination of AJ Green being out and that's going to allow people to load up in the box you're not very good up front uh, that being said, though, when I just look at two things, the talent and the production, there is a tremendous gap in Cincinnati in that running back room. Yeah, it just really surprised, man. Joe Mixon, like this is a guy that had over 1,000 yards last year, looked really good, looked like he was ready to do it. And Zach Taylor comes in and for whatever reason hasn't been able to get on track. Giovanni Bernard has proven that he can catch the ball in the league. Um, but you're right, a very disappointing uh, group, disappointing offensive output, and we've seen it because Ryan Finley is going to be the starting quarterback because that offense hasn't necessarily given the Cincinnati Bengals what they thought that they would get prior to the season. All right, give me an up-and-coming running back group. How about this? How about the Arizona Cardinals being up-and-coming? And it's not because of David Johnson. We've seen David Johnson be on the cusp of being like a 1,000, 1,000 guy in terms of 1,000 rushing yards and 1,000 receiving yards. But the Cardinals have found a running mate. Chase Edmonds has been really effective for them in David Johnson's absence. 295 rushing yards, four rushing touchdowns, um, coming off a big game where he's been able to kind of sneak through creases and cracks uh, a couple weeks ago against the Giants. And then when you get David Johnson back, you now have two guys that can really impact you, not only as runners, but as receivers. Man, when I think about Cliff Kingsbury and as he continues to adjust to the National Football League, he has to feel good in knowing that he has two running backs that can begin to be impactful on the offense the way he envisions it going forward. 
Yeah, now both those guys beat up a little bit, so they go add Kenyon Drake and, and trade for him, Buck. I think we're going to see a lot of Kenyon Drake here in the second half of the season uh, as they try and nurse those guys back to health. But now you've got a chance in the, in this organization. Now you've got three really interesting running backs uh, there for the Arizona Cardinals who fit well inside that scheme uh, with Cliff Kingsbury. Uh, I'm going to go to Cleveland Browns. We saw Nick Chubb get loose against the New England Patriots. Um, this is They got Hilliard, who's a good young back. And look, they're going to get coming off of suspension. You're going to get one of the better runners in the NFL and Kareem Hunt. So if you want to buy stock in a team and you look at the schedule and you look at who they have in that position group, I think we've got a chance to see an explosive dynamic run game from Cleveland here in the second half. Oh, absolutely. I mean, they are on fire. I think the best thing that the Cleveland Browns can do is to pause and realize that on offense, things are a lot better when it runs through Nick Chubb. Let Nick Chubb be the bell cow. Yep. Let him be the, the focal point of the game plan. And then everyone else kind of is prioritized after that. But when Nick Chubb is getting the ball and running to rock, man, this team looks like a physical team. The team that we were starting to fall in love with at the end of the season, make Nick Chubb the priority because you're right. They do have one of the best upcoming young running back rooms that we've seen. All right, let's, uh, let's switch over to the defensive side of the ball. If we're looking at the first half of the season, we're looking at a, a pass rush, a defensive line, outside linebackers, wherever you want to classify it, but just the most impressive group p- rushing the passer there in the first half of the season is who? <laughs> so look, man, I, I tried to find a different answer from your answer, but like I, 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 we just yeah, have you to don't say have to. the San Francisco 49ers right now yeah. have been the most impressive group. And the reason they've been impressive is because they have five first-rounders playing in their rotation, and they all are playing like first round picks. And so we talked about mm-hmm. investing in where we know the marquee positions are on the football team. Well, the San Francisco 49ers haven't done that. They've done it not only through the draft, but in free agency, they poured over D Ford and D Ford has played like a first round pick for them. Everybody is playing at a high level. And I guess the luxury of what they've been able to do is, man, they can limit the snap counts. And these guys are fresh and they're playing from ahead. The San Francisco 49ers have been very, very impressive on the defensive line. Yeah, that, look, that's my answer as well. I mean, we're on the same page here when you look at what they've done and, and add Nick Bosa and how dy- dynamic he has been. I've said this. Look, I'll go on record. He's the best leverage pass rusher I've ever evaluated, just in terms of guys that can get under people and, and just have tremendous power. Uh, I've never seen anybody do it as well as he's done it. So uh, he's a special player. Everybody else is playing at a high level. You got those two twin towers inside uh, with, with DeForest Buckner, as well as Eric Armstead. You mentioned D. Ford. Solomon Thomas is coming coming along. Uh, even Ronald Blair, my guy from App State, has been rolling through there. They've got a lot of depth uh, running those guys through, and they're playing at a very high level. I would just add a couple other teams here, though, that probably deserve some mention. The Saints, with what they've done. Yeah, very know, good. Cam Jordan, we've seen we've seen uh, Davenport, Marcus Davenport, take a leap forward here in his second year. Uh, that defensive line has been very dominant. And then I would also add maybe an underrated group, the Carolina Panthers, who did not rush the pass yes. well last year. They go draft Brian Burns. Uh, we've seen this group kind of take off. Mario Addison's been a good player for them. They've piled up a lot of sacks, so I want to give them some love as well. No, they, they, they certainly have piled up some, some sacks. They have been impressed. They just didn't have a great performance against the 49ers and unfortunate for them, that is a lasting impression. That is what you think about about and so yeah. uh, they've been good Brian Burns uh, for, for me and based on my evaluation he has been better than I anticipated he has made some plays got a ton of quarterback hits he's been very very involved and so for the Carolina Panthers he has been a part of this resurgence that they've had up front all right let's get to uh, the most disappointing uh, pass rush group in the first half is who I'm really disappointed in the Philadelphia Eagles uh, the Philadelphia Eagles are a team that I mean mm-hmm. for so long we've talked about the way that they've built this team they built this team with the the front the trenches the trench warriors uh, first and foremost the way they prioritize those guys on draft day and all the decisions they made and Offensively, they've been okay, but defensively, they haven't been able to do it. Fletcher Cox has been kind of null and void. Now, part of that is because he hasn't played alongside a dominant player. So everyone are double teaming him. They're they're making sure that he is a non-factor in the pass rush, but we haven't seen anybody else step up. Brandon Graham, I mean, mean, like Derek Barnett, we just haven't had enough guys show up, and that's been the disappointing thing. And so for this wide nine defense to work on the Jim Swartz, you have to be able to create pressure and generate it with the front four, and they just haven't been able to do it without blitzing and exposing their corners. Yeah, the, look, they, they played better against Buffalo, but you look, if you take out the game against the Jets, who are awful, 
right? One of the worst offensive lines I've ever seen. I think they piled up 10 sacks in that game. Uh, I'm with you. I thought I expected a little bit more production here from this Philadelphia Eagles group. Uh, they've had flashes. They played well against the you know the Packers. They played well against the Bills, but haven't been as consistent as uh, expectation uh, would have been. So uh, I, I can understand that. I'm going to go look. Atlanta Falcons have seven sacks in eight games. Oof. They stink. Now, the Jets are another team that can't rush the quarterback, but we knew they couldn't rush the quarterback. There was no expectation. When I look at that Falcons team, I look at the coaching staff they have in place, what their expertise is. I look at the first-round picks they have coming off the edges. I look at one of the better interior pass rushers in the league in Grady Jarrett, and it's nothing. I mean, just absolutely nothing from this group now we'll get to their secondary in a minute because they aren't very good either uh, but they've been the most disappointing pass rush to me yeah really 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 disappointing i mean just can't get home man if you can't get home in this league it makes it, it makes it difficult because you can't blitz all the time because you expose your corners leave them in one-on-one -on -one situations most teams would prefer to rush with four so they can keep maximum protection but with the Atlanta Falcons, the, the Atlanta Falcons overall have just been a very disappointing unit. Um, it's unfortunate because they have some good guys. I like Dan Quinn. I like Thomas Dimitrov. But on the field, these guys just haven't been productive at the point of attack. All right. Give me an up-and-coming group here, up-and-coming pass rush group. Mm, this is tough because this is one of my former teams, the Green Bay Packers. The Green Bay Packers are up-and-coming yep. because all the moves that they've made in the offseason have really paid off. Zedaria Smith, Preston Smith, Rashawn Gary. Uh, we've seen their young guys show up and flash. They haven't done it consistently, but, man, the flashes have been impressive because when they're able to flash and they generate pressure, then comes the turnovers. And part of the reason they've been able to generate so many turnovers is because the pass rush has created uh, some pressure on the quarterback. He feels it, and he has to perform under the rest. This Packers team, they go as the turnovers go, but the turnovers come because the pass rush has been a factor and has been effective for Mike Pettin. Yeah, it's a good group. I'm looking forward to seeing them uh, live in person this week. I'm going to go, though, to the, uh, to the Jacksonville Jaguars. Uh, in the draft this year, Dave Caldwell and company and Tom Coughlin, they were given a gift when Josh Allen fell in their lap, I did not think there was any chance he would be there when they picked. They picked him. He's tied with Nick Bosa, seven sacks amongst rookies. He's been outstanding off the edge. You've got Yannick Ngakwe, uh, the rest of that defensive front. Uh, we're seeing guys play at a very high level. So uh, I look at this group. I think they're third in the league or something like that in sacks. They've been getting after the quarterback. So to me, I think it's a lot of young talent. I expect them to do big things as you come through the second half of the season. Uh, very high, very high on this uh, Jacksonville Jaguars pass rush yeah look man the jaguars are coming saxonville quietly is is returning to fame and look the things are, are, are kind of kind of doing uh kind of coming together for the squad so i'm excited to see what what it plays out now the thing that you talk about with the jaguars um I, I just like the way the pieces of the puzzle fit. And I think sometimes we just underestimate how important it is for it to be balanced. I think the moves that they made, Josh Allen coming on like gangbusters, Taven Bryan has been kind of coming on. And then we've seen the steady Eddie, Calais Campbell, much and those better. guys. Yeah, it, it just really, really works for the Jaguars. So hats off to them for kind of getting it right at the point of attack. Hey, and Jags fans, don't forget, you uh, you got a, some extra picks coming your way as a result of that Jalen Ramsey trade as well. So uh, they've got a chance to really upgrade the, upgrade the rest of their roster here in the upcoming offseason. All right, let's let's uh, let's go to the secondary, Buck, and let's go most impressive group. Who do you have? I mean, I think this is easy. I think we, you and I see it from the same thing. The New England Patriots we have, have to, to say be, it, right? Yeah, they have yeah. to be, they have to be the most impressive uh, group. The way the Patriots are able to play. Uh, it's impressive. And normally when you see someone, they, they see a team that has 18, 19 interceptions, it's already impressive. But then the way they're doing it, playing 60, almost 65% of the coverage is man-to-man. -man. So this is a team that is just challenging everything that you do. Their guys are locked up in man-to-man. -man. They're not getting a lot of help from anybody else. And they're just suffocating passing games. And I know everyone say, well, what quarterbacks have they played against? It doesn't matter. All these guys are NFL players. Uh, these quarterbacks can hurt you. We've seen them hurt you at various times in their careers. And the New England Patriots have just bottled up everybody. Uh, they deserve to be at the top of the list. Think about these numbers here real quick. The teams have thrown the ball against the New England Patriots 273 times. During that time, the Patriots have picked off 19 of those 273 throws, and they've allowed two touchdowns. This is eight games. They've allowed two passing touchdowns in eight games. Uh, I mean, I know. look, I don't care who you're playing against. I know the quarterbacks they've played against haven't been great. Uh, the teams, the, the, the records haven't been great. They'll see better competition in the second half, but... 
I don't know if I've ever seen anything like that, Buck. I mean, there's just, you can't get anything on this group. And you're right, they're in your face. Um, they're smart. They marry their pressures with their coverages beautifully. Mm-hmm. Um, it's uh, it's something to watch. It's been it's been teaching tape for the rest of the league. It absolutely has been teaching tape. It's been something that, like, look, as a high school coach, I'm sitting there looking at them and just being like, wow, you can really get away with playing man-to-man that much. And yes, they have some talent, but there are also some undrafted guys in their group. And I just think it's the, the teaching, uh, the coach, the player development and then the talent where these guys are really suited to play man to man all of it is working in the secondary in new england all right let's go to most disappointing secondary in the first half it's funny because the most disappointing secondary no longer exists now but i'm gonna say this the la rams were the most disappointing secondary because the key to leave and marcus peters didn't play like we expected them to play like they were having a tough time staying with their men and they were coverage bust and we saw big plays and explosive plays and the quickest way to lose games in the national football league is to let the ball fly over the head of the defense and that's what was happening in la so you know what the la rams did Got rid of both of them. Akeem Tlaib is now in Miami. Marcus Peters is in Baltimore. He'll upgrade the Baltimore secondary because of the way that he plays. But I have never been more disappointed in a group that I thought was going to be a star collection of a one-two punch on a perimeter than I was with the LA Rams in the way that Marcus Peters and Akeem Tlaib played this season. Well, uh, and look, that. They have an opportunity to try and get this thing turned around now. They've got a chance now. The record is still solid. They're in good position here to get in the postseason, see if uh, this new collection of names can get it done. Uh, Look, the worst secondary in the league is Arizona Cardinals, but my expectations were not high for them, especially with uh, Patrick Peterson. He knew what the suspension was going to mean for that back end. So they've been the worst. But in terms of the most disappointing, I got to double up. I'm going to go back to the Atlanta Falcons. Uh, I said their pass rush was the most disappointing. To me, their secondary is the most disappointing. We mentioned the Patriots and their secondary, uh, you know, only having allowed two touchdowns, picked off 19 balls. It's the exact opposite for the Atlanta Falcons. They've allowed 19 passing touchdowns and they've picked off two balls. That is not a good ratio. Mm -hmm. Uh, So they've given up all kinds of plays. There's been coverage busts, guys running wide open. You go back and watch some of these games, uh, particularly the Houston game, where they're just turning guys wide open when they're rushing three and dropping eight it's inexcusable so to me that's been the most disappointing group i mean very disappointing you just you just expect more um and you're not getting it and so look man you don't want to keep crushing people but man they everything everything on this team that we we could fill out this team in all of these spots with the exception of wide receiver um just a huge yeah. disappointment maybe the biggest disappointment of the year all right, Buck, let's keep it moving here. Uh, an up-and-coming group there in the secondary you're high on. You know, it's funny. Th- this is an up-and-coming group, but I think they arrived last year. How about the New Orleans Saints and the way that they're playing defense? Um, all of their pieces of the puzzle fit really, really well. And Dennis Allen has done a great job. He and Aaron Glenn have done a great job of developing their young guys. Marcus Lattimore and those guys are kind of stepping up and making plays. Um, this defense is just solid. They're solid because they make you earn every yard that you get in the passing game while not conceding a lot of big plays. If you want to play good defense in the National Football League, those things, two things have to be at the top of your priority. And so the fact that Dennis Allen has those guys playing and playing well and adhering to that standard speaks volumes about the coaching and teaching and the talent that they have down in New Orleans. Yeah, that group's played really well, and that entire defense has played great. I'm going to go to the Green Bay Packers, and we talk about building receiving cores and having different body types like a basketball team. You could say the same for the secondary. In this group, uh, with Mike Pettin and company there in Green Bay, when you have Kevin King, who's done a nice job matching up with some of those bigger wide receivers, Jair Alexander, one of the better all-around young corners in the NFL, different sizes, different skill sets, really good football players. And then you look at the rookie. I know he's been injured a little bit, but Darnell Savage, when he's been out there, has been flying all over the field making – Uh, big time plays he's been impressive Uh, maybe a little bit of a surprise when he was picked there in the first round but he has lived up to it and then Adrian Amos coming over from the Bears uh, steady Eddie solid player I think this is a really good group that's going to continue to improve yeah, absolutely. They're going to continue to improve because it, it, is, it is coming on like game bus. So the investment, the investment in the back end. Uh, we're seeing years and years of these guys being drafted, finally getting on the field, finally having an opportunity to make plays. And they're doing it because the pass rush is better. So now when the pass rush is better, the ball comes out, the coverage and the pass rush is married. Uh, great job by the Packers kind of getting it together, getting it done. Russell takes the snap. He's going to throw downfield. He's got it. Touchdown, Seahawks. Russell gets rid of it. Back corner of the end zone. Touchdown, Seahawks. Russell play fake. Now he's going to throw to the back of the end zone. Touchdown, Seahawks. How in the world did he get that through there? Perfect pass by Russell Wilson. Good luck. 
Well, on the Move the Six podcast, we love studying great players, learning more about them, and Russell Wilson would obviously classify as one of the best quarterbacks in the National Football League, probably the front runner right now for the MVP award. So to learn a little bit more about Russell Wilson, we're bringing on our buddy Jake Heaps uh, to join the show, who's a former teammate of Russell Wilson, but more importantly, he's a, he's a partner with Russell Wilson, working with him, training him in the offseason. Uh, he's the head uh, of the Russell Wilson QB Academy and one of the best mentors for young quarterbacks in the country right now. Jake, how you doing, man? Yeah. I'm doing fantastic. How are you guys? Uh, we're doing great, and uh, we're looking forward to this. I mean, obviously, uh, I remember scouting you going through the draft process, and, and you end up spending time up there in Seattle, and, and you really just uh, became really close there with Russell Wilson. You guys have really developed a partnership going forward. I'd love to know just kind of the first time you met Russ and, and what that was like. Yeah, uh, obviously being teammates with him in 16 is really when it started, and my mentality when I came into the building was I wanted to beat Russ. Uh, I wanted to beat him in everything that I possibly could do, whether it was, you know, showing up to the facility, which he shows up at about probably like five, five thirty every single day. So that was quite a challenge. Uh, and try to show <laughs> him that I knew the playbook as much as I possibly could and try and beat him in practice and in practice. Uh, you know, now Deshaun Watson has him as his QB coach, but Carl Smith would always grade us in practice. Uh, based off of how we were doing and with every pass and have a grading scale uh, based off of that. And and my goal was to try and beat Russell every day. And during training camp, I had like a 10-game a stretch, he, he, or 10-day stretch. You might not admit that, but a uh, 10-day stretch where I, I, was, uh, <laughs> I was winning every day. So it was just a competitive, uh, uh, friendly environment that we had in the, in the room. And I think it was something where he respected – uh, my approach and to the game and and trying to uh, be a good backup quarterback for him and and we really sparked a relationship from there and turned into hey he knew that I was doing pr training in the off seasons on the side with high school kids and wanted to be a part of that and so it's been a really fun relationship that we've had in in business but then it also turned into personal where he's starting to look at things and go yeah, I want to get better in my game. And I see that there's areas for me to improve and, and asking me to help in that. And, and over the last two seasons, as we've worked together very closely off the field, um, it's, it's been a, it's been a blast, uh, you know, working together and helping him uh, really sharpen his skills. And again, it's not taking Russell Wilson from, you know, a, a completely different player and making him something different. You don't do that with the greats. All you're trying to do is just help them get, even if it's just 1% better, find one thing, to help them get 1% better. That's really what it comes down to. You know, Jay, what you, what you talk about is a very unique relationship because uh, we all have been in locker rooms and sometimes in the position groups, that competitive nature can kind of make it very, very difficult and challenging for you to build a friendship. But it seems like you guys were able to do it. Um, when you are going in and you're slated to be a backup quarterback, what is that relationship typically like between backup quarterback and starter when it comes to sharing information and doing the things that you're supposed to do in the position room to really make the team better? Yeah, that, it's it's vital. I think first and foremost, you're doing everything you can individually to try and help yourself make the team first. But you also have to show that you can be a great support system for the starter. And there's a couple different ways. Some guys, they really want confidants. They want guys that they can lean into and talk to about certain things that's going on and have that trusted voice to give them sound advice. And then there's the other side of it where guys are just extremely smart X's and O's. They can provide background. They can give little tips into what they're seeing in film study. Uh, and maybe even the starter gives them a certain project. Hey, I want you to take over third downs for me this week. Uh, really look at that and come give me a report. So the backup quarterback plays a vital role. And if you have a great one or one that the, the starter trusts, that's when you really got a special room. And, and uh, that's what it should be. It should be an ecosystem everybody in the quarterback room from the quarterback coach to the assistant QB coach to the backups they should all be there to support that starter as much as possible well I want to ask you about um, uh, just the time management of Russell Wilson because I've heard some I would call them borderline legendary <laughs> stories about how detailed oh, and how man. regimented his day is so uh, I know you know the inner workings there I, when people talk about it being a commitment to play uh, the quarterback position in the NFL it's not a hobby it is a commitment can you give everybody an idea of, of kind of what that time management and what that schedule looks like for Russell yeah it's very unique and for Russell it's not just uh, all the things that he does 
in the building it's outside the building that's really special and and he starts his day off he, like i said he gets to the the vmac which is the seahawks practice facility around 5 36 every single day i mean he's already had spent uh, at least an hour or so maybe two hours before that doing even more work which is film work which is uh preparation with uh you know his body team that he has uh physical trainers massage therapists uh you know his own personal personal trainer, the whole works to get his body right. And I've seen this guy take on or sustain injuries throughout a week where it would take out most starters in this league and he powers through it and he does everything that he can to get his body right and continue to do that. I think 2016, uh, ironically, the year that I was there was the most one of the most difficult years for him. He sustained those two heavy injuries to his leg. And uh, it was it was crazy the prep that he did just to get himself to even play. Um, I always joke with him that he cost me a lot of money that year. <laughs> that uh, you know that was an opportunity for me to, to uh, get activated and, and get some game checks. And uh, you know he's so stubborn and, and through his preparation was able to get himself to play. But you know he really takes it seriously. The work that he puts in um, is second to none. And and every single hour of every single day is regimented. DJ uh, and it's it's something that he has people helping him with to make sure that he's staying on schedule um, every day. So it's it's a commitment, like you said. It's a commitment. It's a desire. It's a passion to be great. And it's not just something that he talks about. He lives through it daily, which is very impressive. As we all know, it's easy to uh, do the lonely work when things are going great. It's hard when it's hard to be consistent. It's hard to do it when things are going tough and just on a daily basis. And that's something that I believe Russell does better than anybody else. You know, and thinking about Russell, uh, what Russell has been able to do is really uh, open up a gateway for all of these maybe undersized dual threat quarterbacks to come into the league. And even though Russell, in my estimation, didn't play like a dual threat quarterback when he played at the NC State and then at Wisconsin, he has allowed uh, general managers to envision uh, an athletic quarterback manning the position. So when you look at Russell and you look at his style of play, how difficult is it for a, a a level athlete to harness some of that athleticism and have the discipline to play in the pocket? That's a great question, uh, Bucky, because I think that's one of the, the hardest things for evaluators to do. And you guys can speak to it because you guys have been there and done that. But uh, is to take a Russell Wilson who is so unique because he was a guy that has always been, like you said, in his college career, has been a passer first who just happened to have mm-hmm. freakish ability to extend plays and and uh and and do special things uh like that and everybody else has taken players that are run first oriented guys and try and make them pocket passers and i think time has uh shown over and over again that it's really hard to make those transitions and now you're seeing younger guys starting to fit in more of that mold baker mayfield being more of a pocket guy than a runner i even think kyler murray fits into that as well although he has special unique traits he played a lot from the pocket Um, and I think Russell was really that first guy to do it. And I think that's where evaluators get wrong. And that's where Lamar Jackson is going to be a fascinating study over the next couple of years, because Lamar, uh, obviously has grown a lot in year two as a, as a pocket passer. And they've done a fantastic, fantastic job. You talk about ecosystem. They've created a great ecosystem there. Um, but it's easier to take a pocket passer and allow him to extend and do special things. That's why Russell has been so unique, uh, in this league is I think that's where people, uh, try to limit Russell in terms of what he is as, Oh, he's this guy who just extends plays and is great out of structure. Uh, he's been great in structure within the pocket for eight years now. He just happens to have a, an amazing highlight reel plays of him extending the pocket and, and making defenses pay from there. All right. We're going to get to some tape here. Cause I want to get your thoughts on uh, three things. Russell does as well, or better than anybody else in the NFL. Before I do that, I want to test one theory that I've had with you. Uh, and it, it goes along with Lamar Jackson and talking about Russell, because, uh, when I study Russell, one of the things that always jumps out to me is how, how uh, great a job he does protecting himself, uh, when he does take off and run. And they, they just barely sprinkle in some design quarterback run zone read stuff. A lot of it is just Russ in a passing play, organically finding space and taking it. 
And when I studied Lamar Jackson, I mean, they're were, they were early in the season. There were 13 design quarterback runs in one game, and it was way it's way too much for me. And yeah. when you watch him take off as a scrambler, I think in it might even have been in that Seattle game. He had three scrambles for like like 60 or 70 yards or something like that. I'm like, he can still get those same yards. Just let it come yes. out of the function of the offense when he can see it and take it. Because I, I just have had the theory, you can protect yourself a lot better on a scramble than you can on a design quarterback run just because the space is so much different. Oh, absolutely. That's a huge part of it. And that's where uh, Russell, when we go back to this conversation of were they pocket passers? Are they, guys, are they guys that operate from the pocket, can do that and function from there and translate in the NFL? Or are they guys that you have to teach and really be a project uh, to – for Lamar, I think part of it, though, is, is that that's how he gets into a rhythm of a game, is he is a all-around football mm-hmm. player that enjoys that quarterback run aspect, and it helps him settle into games at times. Uh, and it will be interesting to watch over time how that comes together for him is does he evolve more? into the pocket does the fact that like rg3 you're using so many quarterback runs on a slender type of body that is are those going to stack up for him over time that's what you're concerned about and russell has always been great about understanding awareness of space and even when he's asked to do the zone replays i mean he's only taking it one or two times a game that and that's it you know it's really him letting Mm -hmm. the defense uh, you know, dictate to him if he's going to take care, if he's going to run with the ball. And and sometimes Russell is at his best when he's being decisive in the pocket, seeing a lane and, and, and going and taking it. But to your point, uh, I think that's why Russell has had this long streak of being able to start as many games as he's had in his eight seasons because he does protect himself. He does have great awareness and he, and he knows the spots when to go for it and when to live for another down. You know, it's funny uh, when you study athletic quarterbacks or mobile quarterbacks, typically they have a tendency. Uh, Most right-handed quarterbacks tend to drift to their right. Uh, Maybe it's a little easier to throw to the right. Um, Let's pop on some tape of Russell Wilson making some plays, and you just kind of break down what you see and just kind of take us through kind of the Russell Wilson experience as you see him play from the pocket. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is it. this is this first one, Jake. Just you're going to see it here is him rolling out, and we'll see uh, what he does on the move. I'm just curious, what are the key teaching points with the guy throwing on the move? Yeah, I think the big thing for Russell is you've seen in the past a lot of times he is retreating, and if you notice in this video, I think over the last two years is what he's really grown in is is stepping up in the pocket and also keeping his eyes downfield as he is. Uh, scrambling it's something he's always been able to find guys but you notice he retreats and if you could play it one more time although he retreats backwards his eyes are downfield always moving forward at the same time that's something that we've really you know emphasized and tried to work on and so when you watch Russell work this year a lot of it is stepping up into the pocket making sure he's coming down and it's just a little manipulation see how fast he got the ball out even when he's in that scramble mode He knows where he wants to go with the football. The Rams here actually, they show a man, uh, they show man indicators and play zone out of it. And Russell knows that Aqib Tlaib is trying to play two on one there. And he just needs to make Aqib commit to one guy so that he can make him pay with the other. And those are the little things right now as, as he's playing MVP type ball. That's because he is operating at that level mentally, knowing that, hey, I got a, I got a corner here that's trying to you know play the seam and also the outside route. I'm just going to make this one little adjustment here to get him to bite and do what I want him to do. What you were kind of explaining there, what I saw as well when you study him, uh, a lot of times you can look at quarterbacks on the move with the accuracy, either it's there or it's not there. A lot of times you can see, are your shoulders, once once you release the ball, is your momentum taking you down the field or is your momentum taking you to the sideline? Russell does a phenomenal job, whether it's to the right or to the left. He's he, his, All his effort and momentum is going forward. He's not falling off. Yeah, and that's something we really work on a lot. Uh, You know, there's been times where he's gotten in trouble doing that, and he is one of the greatest fixers. Uh, I think that's something that, you know, people may not have taken note with Russell as he continues to get better every single year. When he had Max Unger as his center, they let Max take care of the protection calls when he was just getting his feet wet into the league. Max leaves to go to the Saints. Now he has to take over uh, protection calls and responsibilities, and now he is – 
at a PhD level in protection calls. The other side of it is now, I think, when you look at it in terms of the Aaron Rodgers, the Tom Brady's, the Peyton Manning's at the line of scrimmage, it, Russell is on that level now, dictating to defenses, uh, you know, taking what he sees and, and reacting to that and getting them in the proper calls. So Russell, to me, you know, things that he is always, you know, if there's something in his game that he struggled with, he's always continued to look to get better. You know, in the last two years, you know, he's really gotten significantly better from the pocket. He's always been great, but you see him being more comfortable, I should say, from that area, dealing from the pocket um, and, and taking what's given. So I think that's that's the part in Russell's game that you have to love. It's almost kind of like a Michael Jordan mentality. Oh, you say that I can't, uh, you know, uh, lead the league in, in scoring uh, in a year. OK, I'll, I'll go do that and prove you wrong. I assist. Uh, be a defensive player of the uh, year that, yeah I'll, I'll go take care of that to me that's that's Russell's mentality you know when you look at quarterbacks a lot of guys have the mentality they want to push the ball down the field as, as often as they can because the explosive plays come in the passing game especially when you generate those big plays when I look at Russell Wilson throw the deep ball he throws one of the prettiest deep balls that we can find uh, take a look at this video and just explain to everyone what you're seeing when you watch Russell Wilson push the ball down the field yeah, when the Seahawks are able to get the run game going, they're able to create this space. You see how much space there is for Russell right there? Uh, sometimes that is rare for Russell. Uh, you know, you look at pro football focus, Russell's playing behind the 28th uh, best offensive line in terms of pass grade efficiency and and sometimes this play action pass allows them to get to there when you go back and watch this tape now you see the space that he's working with but allows him to have a great base and when he's able to have that base at the top of his drop there's nobody better in the league in my opinion down the field with the football um, and this is a great route concept that the Seahawks have been able to take advantage of Tyler Lockett is so special in these deep play action pass situations with these deep crosses and commands a lot of attention and on that particular play right there you ended up having a cover six structure uh, meaning you had two high safeties playing cover two to the boundary cover four to the field and Tyler uh, had the attention of the backside safety which allowed DK Metcalf to get across the other side of the field um, and so when Russell has that space not only is he great at, at finding the open guy down the field but the other part of it too is when we talk about creating he is also if a guy isn't open because he has the space around him he's always able to extend plays and find guys open and, the, and these receivers especially Tyler Lockett does an amazing job uh, reacting with him and they're one of the most explosive uh teams in the play action game and also in the scramble situation so for Russell this is the type of game and situations that he wants to be in is is getting that deep play action pass game going so that he can have room to create room to see back there in, in instead of you know those normal drop back pass situations I'm glad you mentioned that because that was my question. You led me right to it perfectly, which was at Wisconsin, you know, played behind one of the biggest offensive lines. And so there was concerns about his height. But I, I remember watching him and there was so much play action where I, I'd never seen a quarterback consistently set up as deep in the pocket as, as Russell Wilson did in college. And now they've carried that over beautifully uh, with the Seahawks. But I always it was I mean, it seemed pretty obvious to me. Part of that was to get that type of depth was for somebody that's maybe not the tallest guy in the world uh, to be able to just see. And he's got plenty of arm strength where he can set up, you know, 15 yards behind the snap and still make every kind of throw you want to make but was was that part of the the way they put this offense together with that in mind I think it's part of it. Obviously, if it, that's why Pete Carroll, Russell Wilson are just the perfect marriage. I mean, Russ, uh, Russell is so efficient and, and Pete will always has wanted to run the ball at USC. That's his big part of his philosophy. And now tra translating that in, in Seattle and you had Marshawn Lynch. Now you have Chris Carson. That's a big part of what they do here. And now the play action game is a massive part of Russell's game as well. So you marriage all of those strengths together and you get an offense that although Russell isn't having as many temps as uh, other players around the league. Uh, Russell's not a volume shooter. He's not a Steph Curry. He's not, you know, someone that yeah. uh, needs to continue to shoot to get hot. He's ready to go immediately. Um, and that's the that's the impressive part about him is he's able to maximize his opportunities. And really, he's the tip of the spear. 
you know, for this, for this offense. And he's the explosive aspect of this team. So when they get into those deep play action pass situations, as you watch him, you're always expecting something great to happen. So yeah, I think it's part of, uh, for Russell to get, to get that space for him to see. Um, he's always looking and seeing through lanes. When you talk to Russell and you talk to Drew Brees, they're always talking about seeing through lanes and trying to anticipate when he's in this position right here, you know, 10, nine yards back, he doesn't have to do as much as trying to see through those lanes. You know, you talked about him being the explosive piece, the explosive element to the Seahawks offense. The one thing that shows up consistently on tape, the explosive plays tend to happen when he scrambles and he makes things uh, on his own. Um, look, some of it is when he, he dials it up and throws down the field, but a lot of it is when he just takes off. Tell me what you see when you look at the tape and you see him break the pocket. Yeah, uh, I laugh here because Russell, it, uh, again, I come back to this analogy of, you know, what type of player are you? Are you a Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant? Um, are you a guy that wants the ball in your hands at the end of the game? And and that's Russell Wilson. You know, most of the time when you see Russell uh, uh, run, it is towards the end of the game and he wants the ball in his hands. And this is exactly that situation, you know, for Seattle. This is to this is to seal the game. This sets up a fourth and one for the Seahawks to try and, you know, run the clock out and win the game. Um, Russell, when he is decisive, when he's decisive about finding lanes and taking off, uh, really, Really, it is very difficult for defenses to, to contain him. He still has that ability to make people pay. Um, you know, people want to look at maybe that he's hit 30. Does he have that same running ability? He absolutely does. And that's a perfect example of that. And and Russell is great at picking and choosing his moments throughout a given game, not trying to force the issue with his legs. But you're right, Bucky. I, I think a lot of it for Seattle, what they rely on, is Russell Wilson to make those types of plays. If you look around the league and as much as tape, as much tape as you guys watch, you see that when you watch Kansas City and some of these other teams that they are scheming people open. That there are there are times where guys are just wide open. And for Seattle when you watch mm -hmm. them, there's not as much happening in those situations. So then what gives? It's either you got an offense that's going to stall out or you've got an amazing playmaker uh, under center for you that's able to extend and that's what Russell Wilson is. He's a great eraser. Uh, of mistakes around him offensive line play over the last few years and sometimes in these situations where plays are dead to rights he has that ability to make you right as a play caller and and I know that's one aspect of his game that when you look at and really study that pops out and for him playing at this MVP type of level so far I think is really impressive for one uh, the offensive line play that he has to uh, the amount of creating that he's having to do at times uh, and staying so efficient. This is not just a creator that's that's a, a wild card out there. He's being I mean, he's only thrown one interception this season. Uh, he he is, uh, you know, leading the league in touchdown passes, uh, you know, on limited amount of attempts and, and has the highest uh, passer rating uh, in the NFL right now. So those are all the things that you talk about is it's, it's very hard. And especially you see it in young players right now that are that create creating type of quarterback, uh, protecting the football, being efficient with it and can constantly putting your team in the best situation possible. And that's what Russ does. I'll tell you what, I, I wrote down a couple different words when you're talking about describing great quarterbacks, distributor, creator, eraser. Um, I think all those all those words would accurately uh, describe Russell Wilson and his game. Uh, I, I'm going to let you go here in a second, but I do want to get your thoughts on one thing because we we're talking about this a little bit before we started this interview. Um, you know, Bucky is, is taking off in this new coaching career and he's got this program <laughs> turned around uh, yeah. football games. Uh, but, but, but Jake, I want you to know now, this is the school that Bucky's coaching at, which is where, where one John Elway went to school. And as a quarterback, I heard that. as someone who was as as highly decorated as, as any quarterback in the country when you were coming out of high school and had your pick of the litter of schools, um, on a scale of 1 to 10, knowing how little Bucky throws the ball, and I'm talking like you can count it on one hand in some of these games with how little they throw the ball, how disgusted does that make you feel, Jake, to know that he's doing this? One, one, I'm shocked because if I know Bucky, if I know Bucky from our, from our days on the elite 11 opening tour, you know, this is a, this is a receiver at heart, right? I mean, he wants, he wants to distribute. I know. One, I, know. I, I am, I am, I, I have to, I have to give hats off to Bucky to be disciplined, disciplined and knowing his team's strengths, right. And executing it. Now, would I want to go there? 
in this case, uh, no, no, I would not. But uh, you know, Bucky, you keep Jake, you keep coaching Jake, to the strengths of your team, man. I'm proud of you. You're killing it. Hey, Jake, I don't know how many top level quarterbacks you're going to be recruiting these days. Hey, Jay, look in in eight in eight games, we have 28 pass attempts, but. What I want you to, oh, but, but what, but what I would, this is like a dagger to oh, my heart, right my heart. Right now. But No, but, but what that's I would what like, that is. that's I the would same like, thing. I would like to envision a young Jay keeps playing in like a Seattle Seahawks like offense that when you throw it, they're going to be touchdowns. They're touchdowns oh, waiting okay. to be thrown. We just haven't got to that part of the playbook, but it's right there for you. So a, a young Jay keeps, gotcha. we bring you in. We're setting you up to just throw these touchdowns because they're all right there. 28 pass attempts in eight games do the math man look at this recruiting <laughs> job right here this is fantastic by bucky brooks you've got me sold man I, i'm you know one of these young quarterbacks that's out here in california is yeah. gonna be the difference maker to exploding that offense up it needs it 28 pass attempts come on man <laughs> The, the, if you go to practice after practice, you'll see every player on the team ice on their legs. Not nobody ice on their arm. I can yeah. promise you that. Nobody. That quarter. That quarterback is is dying to get some reps. He's probably staying after trying to throw some balls. Come on. Uh, oh man! I, I, I thought you'd have something to say about that. Hey, Jake, this has been uh, awesome, certainly. man. Uh, we're uh, we're big fans of yours. It's been great to get to know you a little bit over the years. You do a fantastic job, and uh, I look forward to catching up with you soon down the road here. Yeah, thanks, guys. Let's do it again soon. Had a blast, and uh, it's going to be a fun second half of the season, that's for sure. Well, Buck, it's great to catch up with uh, with Jake Heaps. We ended up going a little bit long there, but I didn't want to slow it down because it was such a fascinating conversation, learning more and more about Russell Wilson. But we are going to delay hits and misses. I know I teased that at the top. We'll do that yep. next week, so I'll have uh, something for you to look forward to there. But I do want to, before we get out of here, answer some of these fan questions that, uh, that popped up on Apple Podcasts. So, Nabil, hit us. What do you got here? How do scouts adjust evaluations and their processes for lower division athletes as compared to FBS? And if any teams traditionally have better success with scouting these levels? Mm. Well, I think it's a lot easier now, Buck. Wouldn't you agree? Like when we first started, the tape quality wasn't as good. Um, you didn't have uh, opportunities to see as many of these kids. And, and uh, you know, the budgets are all different now. And so to me, it's a lot easier to scout these players. My advice to, to young scouts has always been, look, if, you, if, you're, if you're watching somebody on Division Two tape, don't even look up their number. Just watch the first, you know, 15, 20 plays. If, you know, hopefully that guy jumps off the screen and you go, okay, he needs to be dominating at this level. Uh, who is the who is the, the NFL prospect on the field. You should be able to find him. That's one way to kind of look at it. But you always uh, then it's a key when these guys get to all-star games and whenever they step up in competition. Sometimes these Division II teams, uh, they might play a, a, a really good Division I AA team or you see, you know, an FCS team play in, you know, one, you know, one FBS game. So those are the games you always want to watch, the best competition they play. It's funny that you said it, uh, DJ, because I think this is, is really one of the biggest challenges that you have as a scout. When you're looking at a lower level player, um, the dominance has to pop off tape. Um, if you can't dominate at a lower division, you're going to have a tough time making it and having success in the league. Secondly, the regular season matchups that they play against uh, higher level teams, uh, you, you add even more weight to those games. Uh, we can talk about it, and this is not even uh, Khalil Mack played at Buffalo, which is a D1 school, but the Khalil Mack game versus Ohio State was a huge game for him. How did he perform against the best of the best? He dominated that Absolutely. game. That led scouts to believe that he would be able to dominate at that level. Um, I'll go back from a personal experience. When Vincent Jackson was coming out of Northern Colorado, um, yeah. I went in and I watched him, and he was a dominant player who was also a really good basketball player in high school. And I was so kind of torn on how big to make the grade that I wasn't even working for the Green Bay Packers, but I called Ron Wolf and I asked Ron, I said, Ron, when Terrell Owens was coming out of school, and you saw him at UT Chattanooga. How did you know to give him a big grade? He said it is clear and apparent that he is a man amongst boys at his level, and he has the size, and you can envision him having that kind of success at the next level. Put a big grade on him, then follow it up at the All-Star game, because typically those guys find their way to All-Star games. If they have similar success at the All-Star game and they don't look like a fish out of water, that's when you can really go big on your grade, because you know that you've seen them at every level and they didn't look like the game was too big for them i think that's a great i think it's a great advice and look it, it don't make it more complicated than it is i mean you cannot be a, you don't draft good players from lower levels you draft great elite special players from lower levels so uh, that to me is kind of the the way i look at that all right Nabil, we got another one 
Uh, yeah, next one. Bill Walsh said that he believed there were only a handful of teams with championship culture. How many and which teams do you believe have a championship culture in the NFL today? Ooh, want me to want me to throw out some names here, Buck? Yeah, throw out some. Because I, I think that's a good question. I, there aren't thirty-two, and I mean, I I think there's you could say there's more than eight. But if I'm just off the kind of the top of my head, just looking at some names of different teams here, if I want to say championship culture, and that means just kind of a little bit of a track record there, the front office, the coaching staff being on the same page and being a good environment. I look at traditional teams. I mean, you've got New England, Baltimore, Pittsburgh. I think Indianapolis is building something special there with Chris Ballard and Frank Reich. I think that's a great culture. Philadelphia, they've had a Super Bowl. I think that what they do is a a really nice job there. Howie Roseman, Doug Peterson work so well together. Green Bay, historically for a long time, has had a great culture there. Um, I think that you've seen Lafleur has kind of stepped in and they've been able to get uh, right back up on top. And then uh, I would say a couple more teams, New Orleans, uh, the the Rams and the Seahawks. I think that's, I mean, how many is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's nine teams right there. I think there's probably three or four more you could probably put in there, but those those nine I kind of put up there at the top. Yeah, I, I think what you're looking at when we talk about a, a championship culture is we're looking for a level of consistency, and that consistency doesn't mean that this team yep. is, they're always in the playoffs, but they're always kind of around, they're always in the mix because being a consistently good team in the National Football League is hard, so I always kind of lean on the teams that are always right there. It doesn't mean they're always going to be in the top six in their conference, but they're around. Uh, teams that I wanted to bring up that I think KC, are kind of... KC should go in there too. Yeah, so I had KC down. Uh, I had the Minnesota Vikings down because of the way their style of play or whatever. I wrote the Carolina Panthers down because of the consistency of what they have in the front office. The team that I believe is obviously on the upswing, that would be the San Francisco 49ers. And the reason why I'm going to say the yep. San Francisco 49ers are now building and adopting a championship culture, it not only stems from Kyle Shanahan and John Lynch, who both have kind of been around teams that have gone to the Super Bowl, and John Lynch has won a Super Bowl. But when I look at the way they're developing their players, their style of play, run game, championship level defense, they have a franchise quarterback, and they've sprinkled in enough veterans that have been able to get to the, the, the winner's circle. That matters because when you get down the stretch, football changes, and you have to have enough guys that have that experience where when the game gets big, they don't shrink in the lights. And that not only includes players, but coaches and management because you can't have a situation where we're close to the big dance and everybody takes on this level of panic or desperation. That's not how you win the biggest games. Let me give you one nugget here on the 49ers, and we've been on this podcast pumping this team for a long time. This goes back to the summer where we were all over these guys. Um, This is what I was told about the 49ers and their building, Buck. It is a dream. It is all ball. And they said that is from Kyle Shanahan. That is John Lynch. That is everybody on that coaching staff. He said there is no nonsense. There's There's no politics there's no infighting he said literally it is like a football think tank in there with their minds coming together putting together their game plans every week all these contributors um it was fascinating to just hear the way they talked about it because they said it's a coach's dream because you come in here you don't have to worry with any of the other nonsense some of these other teams are fighting the infighting none of that it is just all ball and i thought that uh, that was pretty interesting look man that, that, that's absolutely what you want when we talk about like the infighting like some people who have never had opportunity to work in front office they don't know about the office politics that exist in any job where you have people campaigning and climbing and trying to get the next man's job as opposed to everybody just really focusing in on maximizing uh, what they're doing in their current job and really keeping the main thing the main thing and in the National Football League the main thing is to build a consistent winner and to be able to vie for championships each and every year when you talk about the San Francisco 49ers being all in just all ball it means that every decision that is made is made with being the the ultimate winner in mind and there are no hidden agendas everybody is trying to pull the boat in the right direction and when you get that and you get complete buy-in from management to coach to players that's when the special things happen Yep, and special things are definitely happening there right now. Uh, team's undefeated and rolling. All right, that's going to do it for us for the show today. I want to thank you guys for uh, listening to this show. Do us a favor if you can. We'd, we'd like to continue to get the word out on the Movie Sticks podcast. Get on social media. Um, give us a little plug there. Encourage your friends to check us out. Uh, we, man, this, we're having so much fun. We're learning each and every episode, talking to great guests. I hope you're enjoying it as much as we are. Uh, but just continue to try and get that word out. So if you could, leave us one of those reviews on Apple Podcasts. We appreciate that as well. Any other thoughts, Buck? 
No, nah, man, this is great, man. I I can't thank Jake Heaps enough for coming on and kind of giving us a little a little glimpse, pulling the curtain back on Russell Wilson. That was fantastic. I think everyone would benefit from listening to that interview that he had. Yeah, and we did uh, a fun X's and O's a discussion with him. So if you want to see a video of that, that should be up on NFL.com slash MTS video. You can see Jake Heaps kind of breaking down what makes Russell Wilson so special. All right, that's going to do it for us today. Thank you guys for listening, downloading, subscribing, all that good stuff. Big thanks to Nabil uh, behind the glass. Kent back working with us once again. Uh, it's been outstanding. Mark Brady, kind of the captain of the ship. David Singer getting us our guests. A uh, whole host of people making this Move the Stick show happen. We appreciate all of you. We'll catch you next time, right? here.